gentlemen, let's look at Nahum chapter 1. We did the whole background last week, so we're not going to go through that again. Um, remember, it is the Assyrian army are still intact at this time. Forty years previous to this, Jonah was sent by God to Nineveh, which is modern-day Damascus, so to speak, uh, to tell them to clean up their act or else God's going to clobber them. And Jonah did that somewhat reluctantly. We studied Jonah. You know the whole story of that. And then got all bent out of shape because God didn't waste them because they repented and all that. Well, in the meantime, 40 years later, uh, they have changed kings. That old king died and they brought in a new young upstart. They have changed uh, commanders of the army from Naaman to... Um, the new the Sennacherib. <laughs> we had trouble with that last week. So the new commander of the army is Sennacherib, and he is quite a force to be reckoned with. And he would come around, and they will destroy the ten tribes of the, of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now they think they destroyed it because they're a great and mighty army, which they were in that day and age. But God allowed them to be destroy, destroy it because His people. Uh, had gone terribly wrong. And of course Ahab and Jezebel, kings and queens like that, led them down the road to fertility worship. It was a lot more fun than going to the synagogue and behaving yourself and reading the word of God and praying and being honest before the Lord to go up to the mountains, the high places they are referred to in the scriptures. And, you know, drink wine till you're stupid and then have sex with any and everybody around there. And that was the fertility worship stuff. And it turned into a big drunken party every night. And that was a whole lot more fun than being responsible before the Lord. Well, eventually, pretty much most of Israel was going that direction, as far as we can tell. But the southern kingdom is still holy unto the Lord. They are worshiping in the temple and doing everything God told them to do. So the southern kingdom, under good kings like Uzziah and Joash and all those guys, they were very godly men, and God was important in their lives. So, was, so they made God important in everybody's life. So they were safe. They were okay. The Assyrians will go down there and try and take them, but then the Lord will wipe them out in one hand. So that would be that. Then when they get back home, what's left of them, of course, the Babylonians come in. Now you got a new problem to deal with. All right, let's look at the Oracle of Nineveh. It is the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. Elkoshite. He always feared hunting season, you know, because he's an Elkosh. A little Old Testament humor there. Very little. <laughs> Behold, a jealous, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. See, we always see God as the good guy, the nice guy. Until you go down the wrong road. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes his vengeance upon his adversaries. He reserves the wrath for his enemies. For the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is his way, and the clouds are dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea, and it dries up. He dries up the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. The mountains quake because of him, and the hills will dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his very presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it, who can stand before his indignation or anger? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath, his wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are broken up by him. Yet the Lord is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies to the utter darkness. Whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress 
will not rise up twice like tangled thorns. And like those who are drunken with their drink and they are consumed and stubble completely withered. From you has gone forth. One who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Well, thus says the Lord. Though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they shall be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break his yoke bar from upon you and I will tear off your shackles. For the Lord has issued a command concerning you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. For I shall cut off both idol and image from the house of your gods. And I shall prepare your grave for you have become contemptible. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah, and pay your vows, for never again will the wicked, men, wicked one pass through you, for he shall be cut off completely. What do you think? Not a message I'd like to get. <laughs> <laughs> well... Until no. verse 15, that's a There's, there is a lot of trouble here. And the Lord, you know, oftentimes because he is an invisible God, let's face it, out of sight, out of mind. How many of us have done that in our life? Oh, about a billion times. You know, where's that thing I told you to mail? Uh, somewhere. Everybody's got to be somewhere. Why didn't you mail? Well, I didn't see it. I left it right there for you. Of course, they never leave it right there for you. It's a plot that women know just to aggravate men. And there it was right there for me, just like she said. And it didn't get mailed, and that's the way life is sometimes. And as simple as that is, forgetting something that wasn't seen, how much easier is it to forget a God who can't be seen? or who won't be seen, put it that way. The Lord instructed Moses, the last thing he said before they entered the promised land at all. They sat the whole tribe down, the whole nation down, on the side of the river, the Jordan River, and before they took the first step over that river into the promised land, he said, retell them my law, and this time make them listen. So they sat everybody down, and we have the book called Deuteronomy, which means a retelling of the law. That's what Deuteronomy, doing it again, do it again. This time, listen up. And throughout the course of this version of the law and the Leviticus version of the law, God adds a little something. And the thing he adds to the Deuteronomic version of the law is one word, remember. Listen this time and remember. When you enter the land and you see it's flowing with milk and honey, which means very prosperous area, and your stomachs are full and your fine paneled houses are built, and you know it's Sabbath and you should be down at the temple worshiping the Lord, remember this, because if you don't, I will come and I will sweep you, your king, and your fine paneled houses away with a single thought. I will destroy you, I will destroy your flocks, I will destroy your fields, I will destroy your herds, your money, your gold, your silver, everything will be lost, just like that. So the second telling of the law, you get this remember, remember, remember. Well, why would God do that? Because we are human. <laughs> and that's not a very good excuse. <laughs> I mean, we say it to each other all the time. Oh, I'm only human. No, you're not. <laughs> you are created in God's image. You are master of your domain. You are the, the conqueror, the champion over all the rest of creation. That's who you are, or at least that's who you God intended for you to be. So where is God in all of this? Have you gone to church lately? Oh, I'm Catholic. <laughs> when was the last time you went to church, Catholic? 
you know, well, 28 years ago, I was baptized or something, about 28 years ago. Right, I bet God's real pleased with you. I don't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. And I don't have the right to judge. God take, took that away from me, because I'd be really good at it. <laughs> Come on, Lord, let me judge. Let me judge. <laughs> Hold up there, big boy. You just stand back. You're not so good yourself. Yeah, but it's okay. <laughs> it's not okay. And that's how easy it is to push God aside. And I've seen it in 45 years of ministry a million times. They come, they get all excited, they're all yahoo, yahoo and about God and Jesus and all that stuff. And then suddenly one day something doesn't go their way. Or they prayed for something and it didn't happen, it didn't come through, mom wasn't healed, dad wasn't, whatever. And the next thing you know, they're out the door. And you never see them again. 30 years later, are you going to church anywhere? Well, I give up on all that stuff. Just a bunch of nonsense. Or the other excuse, besides I'm Catholic, the other excuse is, well, the church is just full of hypocrites. Well, of course it is. <laughs> That's why we're there, to try and stop being hypocrites. You know, the, the church is not a showcase for saints. It's a hospital for the sinners. Okay, the people that have been, been beat up, that needs a little bandaging, needs a little loving care and tender, kind-heartedness. That's why we're all here. Because the Lord said, he, Jesus said it a hundred times in the Gospels, it's not if, it's when the world starts punching on you and banging on you and beating on you. They hated me, they're going to hate you. It's that simple, boys. It ain't rocket science. And I tell you this so that when it happens, you'll remember, oh, wow, Jesus said this would happen. Hang on to each other. Go to church. Pray. Preach. Learn the Word of God. Let the Word abide in you. Pray. Talk to God. You know, sing. He loves singing for some reason. And I've heard some of you sing. He's got to have a really good sense of humor. And lastly, mutual edification. See, there's the key. It's a hospital for the, for the busted up. So when Katie comes dragging into church, oh, woe is me, and sits down next to Angela, Angela, you can say, Katie, you look terrible. <laughs> What's wrong? I'm not that part. Hey, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do look terrible. No, no. <laughs> She's an exceptionally good sport. <laughs> but see, the, the, the key there is to say, Katie, it looks like you're having a rough time. You know, Kenny Rogers wrote a song about that, didn't he? The Gambler. He said, boy, he said, met a boy, I made a life out of looking, reading people's faces. Yeah. And it looks like you could use a little help. <laughs> anyway, that whole song's about before the gambler dies, he gives the little kids some uplift and help. And you got to know when to fold them, know when to hold them, know when to walk away, know when to run away. Anyway, as silly as that sounds, that's what prophets were all about. Nahum was not the bad guy for God. He was a guy that's grown up in this culture. Remember, he's a Jew also. He grew up in the culture and he brings to mind a physical reminder of a very invisible practice. And that is, why aren't we in temple? Why aren't we in synagogue? Why aren't we before the Lord bowing, humbling ourselves, listening to his word? They read the scrolls every week. Jesus used that many times. He would read the scrolls. Uh, why are we not praying, talking to God, unafraid, humbled before him? Why are we not singing the great hymns, the great psalms? For crying out loud, every one of them psalms was a song that could be sung. Why are we not singing these? And she's had a busted leg a bad week for the last 23 years. Why are you not helping her? You see? In fact, I, didn't I preach on that recently? Jesus healed a bent over lady in the church and then everybody, all the priests got aggravated. Mm -hmm. There's six days to do the work of the Lord. You don't have to do it on the Sabbath. Lady's been over for 18 years. What, what better day to do it? She was being faithful. She was in church. <laughs> 
probably sitting in the back, bent over. Nobody's talked to her in 18 years. Nobody's cared about her in 18 years. Jesus doesn't even ask her, what do you want? Do you want to be healed? He just goes up and goes, Pow. your faith has made you well. Get up. Stand up. And she did. And everybody went, whoa. And they were amazed. And they saw God, an invisible God, which... In the back of their minds, they'd long since put on the back shelf. Yeah, I'm a Jew. Yeah, I got to go to the temple. Yeah, I mean, so almost like saying, well, what church do you go to? Oh, well, I'm a Catholic. That's not the question you ask a Catholic. The question you ask is, when was the last time you were in worship? Well, you know. And my parents were devout Catholics, and I don't fault them for that at all because it was a wonderful religion to grow up in. But they were really devout Catholics. Dad would have to be bleeding arterially for him to miss church. Mom, same way. She gathered us up and she had to deal with boys every Sunday. Bobby and Stephen and I was the baby. So I was cute no matter what I did. <laughs> I did a lot <laughs> that aggravated that woman's life. The point is, mom and dad were physical reminders of a very invisible God. And every time I went into church, I guarantee you, at St. Anthony, I went in and I entered, and it was a huge cathedral and school and everything. I went in and I looked up for that light of assurance little candle over the altar high usually swinging from the roof somewhere and if it were lit God was there and it was supposed to be lit forever would never go out and I'd always walk in there and look up especially the altar boys we'd all we're in there to you know get some hosts and that, those big hosts that the priests ate we always got little scrumpy things but the big ones that priests ate they were like crunchy you could put peanut butter in between them and put it down it's awesome. <laughs> but before we stole them, we had to make sure it's God here. <laughs> we were all looking at that candle of assurance. That candle, boys, is meant to tell you God's here for to bless you, not to smack you over the head for stealing my hosts. <laughs> George did it. <laughs> the childhood days. It's amazing. Seems like it's a lifetime ago. Oh, wait a minute. It was a lifetime ago. <laughs> but that candle of assurance, and in every church we went in, in Europe, on this latest trip, they were all lit, except one. This is a church I want to go to. <laughs> you can get away with anything in this one. <laughs> that candle of assurance was to bring to your vision and my vision, the assurance and the presence of a very invisible God. Well, Jesus Christ was the same thing. In the old days, we got bits and pieces of the Lord revealing himself to us through visions or through angels or through events like, you know, great battles. But in the nowadays, we see him fully and completely in the person of Jesus Christ. The problem is, Nahum is 615 years before Jesus would show up. So Nahum doesn't have the image of God or the image of Christ. He doesn't have the working of the miracles. He has his own history of the Lord dealing with the Egyptians, of the Lord dealing with the Amorites, of the Lord dealing with the Hittites and the Hussites and everybody else. But his job is to go and convince these people that God is as alive as ever before. Nothing's changed because the Lord doesn't change. He's as powerful over creation as he ever was because he made creation. And believe it or not, the seas and the hills and the birds and the animals, they all know that. The only animal that doesn't is us. Because we're easily influenced. And one of the greatest weapons Satan has in his arsenal is, Chris, you need to go to church and preach. I mean, not preach, but listen to the Word of God. Pray to your God, you need to be there to sing and worship your God, and you need to be there to take care of everybody else in that room, especially Kitty, she's fat. 
victory. <laughs> but, you, you know, that's what Satan says to you. But then afterwards he goes, but you don't have to do it today. I know you want to go fishing. I know you want to go out on the boat. I know you want to take hands. You need to smooch a little bit out on the boat. So do that, and you know we got plenty of time to do the worship stuff. Uh, I, I think that that's something that everybody forgets, especially all the way back to Genesis when he says, "Did God really say that? Yeah. Did he really say that? Did he put that in somebody's mind?" In the Gospels, all the way through to Revelation, you'll see another word beside remember. That was the Old Testament phrase. New Testament phrase, one word again. You'll see it a million times in the New Testament. Today, if you hear his voice. Today, if the Holy Spirit inspires you. Today, if you run across a clue or a sign or something that points to Jesus do not be like your forefathers in the Old Covenant who put it aside. Yeah, we'll get around to it. That's a Southern thing. You've got to be watching that. I'm fixing to get holy. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't holy yet. You just fixing to get holy. Well, I'm fixing to send you to hell. <laughs> I ain't done it yet. But it's coming. Here, what's this? It's your hand basket. I don't want you to be. I don't want you to be disappointed. Because <laughs> you're going to hell in a hand basket. And I'm fixing to do it. This is Nahum's job. I need you to go into this people that you grew up with that you know are a stubborn, obstinate, and arrogant people and tell them things are not well. In fact, they're worse than not well. They're flat out bad. And I've had enough. I've had enough. Now, did God give them any warning? Well, you remember that just before this Nahum event, over here in the Mediterranean, there's a little peninsula that sticks out. This is called Mount Carmel. This is one of Je uh, Jezebel, the queen of uh, Israel up here, and the ten tribes. This was one of her favorite hangouts. It was a high place. They had a big old altar built up there and they'd offer fires and all that stuff. And then they'd have all their fertility worship and all this stuff. And it's called, unfortunately, Mount Carmel. You ever hear that name before? What's his face at Waco or Waco, Texas? He had his camp there. It was called Mount Carmel. Yeah. And, it, and it burned. Who is it? No, I forgot. Well, it burned to the ground, remember? Yeah. And they blamed the FBI for setting it on fire and all those people died. Well, that's kind of what happened at Mount Carmel. They would burn stuff and have big orgies and all this stuff up there until Elijah came to town. And Elijah said, Is your gods, or are your gods, any better than our gods? And he says, I'll tell you what, build two altars. So they built two altars, you know. And the, and the deal was that you uh, put a lamb up on the altar, put an animal or whatever sacrifice you want, and then we'll both pray to God and we'll call down fire. And, and we won't light the fire. We'll ask God to kindle the fire to offer that sacrifice. And that was the deal. Well... Elijah said, you guys go first. And they had 450 prophets up there. Prophets and prophetesses. Female and male. And the 450, if you remember, they cried out and they jumped around and they danced and they sang. and I mean, for hours and hours and hours. Most of the day and well into the night. Screaming and hollering and going round and round and round in circles until literally they were cutting themselves and flinging blood all over the altar to make, you know, make it look like they're really putting in the time and the work. And, you know, it, morning came, they were all exhausted, <coughs> half bled out, stupid people. And if you remember, nothing happened. So they said, okay, we didn't get anything done. Uh, how about you? You try. 
So Elijah goes out there and says, well, I can't call down fire from heaven. You know, this is just a task far too simple to ask of my God, basically is what he said. So I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to dig around the temple, uh, around the altar, all the way around it. Here, I'll use a different call. I want you to dig big ditches around and build walls of dirt up around the temple, all the way around it, even up to the sacrifice itself, sand walls and all that. Then he made them go down to the ocean and get water and bring it up and pour the water in. And they went and did this like seven or eight times. And they filled it up. And they filled it up. And they filled it up. So now this is all full of water. And they said, what in the world are all you doing? He says, now I will call upon my Lord to see if uh, whose, whose God is true and whose God is false. And of course, he called upon the Lord and boom, instantly, fire came down. His sacrifice was gone. His altar was gone. The water was gone. Everything was gone. And Elijah, one guy standing here going, uh, Lord, very cool. He was impressed with a he says, this is the one true God. Well, at that point then, God told Elijah to capture these 450 priests and destroy them because they are liars and their gods are false. Well, they, they killed them all. Elijah had the troops come in and grab them all and kill them. Well, Jezebel heard this. Jezebel, she named herself after the Baals, the fertility gods, and said, send this message to Elijah. He'll be just as my priests are by nightfall. By the end of the day, he's toast. Well, Elijah, and this is problematic, after this incredible event at Mount Carmel, runs away, way down here. About down to Mount Korah, back where Moses got the Ten Commandments. And he's sitting there in a mountain, and God shows up and, and says, Is that you, Elijah? And he says, Yes, Lord. He goes, What are you doing here? He asked him three times. Well, I was doing it, and then the fire, and so I'm telling him the whole story, and then the old boy, we killed all that, and then Jezebel said, boy, you're toast by the end of the day, blah, 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 so I just ran away down here because I didn't know where else to go. And having heard all that, God looks at him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Three times he asked him that. Don't you have somewhere to be more important than here? Well, he came to his senses and said, yeah, if, really, if I mean, wow, God's on my side. Who can really be stand against me? Now you got it. You see, God became invisible, even to this mighty prophet, to the father of the prophets. Witnessing an event like that, wow, that would convince me for at least a little while he got the word of a hussy up here and he ran like a scared rabbit down to the hole and said, I'll just stay here. Elijah, what are you doing here? And I think God would like to say a lot of the same question to a lot of Christians today. Well, I'm at the skating rink. Well, I'm at Disney World. Well, I'm at Universal. Well, I'm at Gator World. Well, I'm at Carpet World, you know. People like carpet. And I think God would say every Sunday, what are, you, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be at your temple or at your church or at your Catholic cathedral? Shouldn't you be somewhere other than here? Well, I can praise God from a fishing boat. Yes, you can, but you can't be obedient to God in a fishing boat because he didn't say gather together in a fishing boat with the assembly of the righteous. What did he say? gathered together in the temple with the assembly of the righteous. 
at the appointed time. God doesn't care if you do it at 8 o'clock in the morning or 3 in the afternoon. But whenever you decide to do it, do it. Well, see, this is Nahum's job. Is the, the, the nation's already gone bad. Listen to what God's saying, or Nahum is saying on the part of God. Uh, have you guys forgot that God has a bad side? Have you forgot that? I mean, you live in large, no doubt. The little orgies on the mountain are real cute. God hates them. Did you forget that God is avenging and wrathful, that the Lord takes his vengeance very seriously, brings it upon his adversaries? You know, oh, Jew boy and Jew girl, you are now his adversary. Did you think about that for a minute? The Lord is slow to anger generally, and he's great in power. And it's good he's slow to anger because his power is untold. And the Lord will be will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. You remember that? See, this God we believe in also has a moral side, a righteous side, as we're told by the Old Testament, never changes. Wrong is still wrong. A lie is still a lie. A sin is still a sin. And if we are guilty of any of that, whether we see him around or not, makes no difference. Let's go back to Jonah. Are these people all the way up here in Nineveh subject to our God Yahweh, who we believe made Nineveh and the people therein? They didn't acknowledge God until Jonah came to town. And Jonah said, my God says 40 days and you're a parking lot you don't repent. And they repented and God relented on his judgment. And Jonah got upset about it. Why didn't you crush those guys when you had the chance? The only one unaware of God is who? Jonah at that point. Our God is slow to anger. But don't take his slow to anger as weakness as he is still great in power. A lot of times we mistake God's compassion for weakness. Don't do that. God has given you another chance, another chance, even Jesus in the parable of the fig tree. For three years I've come to this fig tree and looking for figs and I got nothing. And the vine dresser steps in and says, look, wait, my Lord, give me one more year. No dig around it. I'll put fertilizer in. I'll water it real good. And then next year, if there's no figs, fire away. Well, that's not say, showing God's weakness, is it? It's showing God's compassion and His mercy. I'll give you a little time to clean this mess up. All the way back to Cain and Abel. Cain, why is your countenance down? Why are you bummed out? He says, I'm bummed out. You see, you're a little bummed out. You know, boy, I've been reading faces for a long time, and you're so like you could use a little help. Then the Lord says, if you, if you do the work of the God, if you do the work of the Lord, won't your countenance rise? I mean, if you do something well-pleasing and well-sacrificial for the Lord, in other words, go back to the truth and mean it this time, won't God be proud and glad of that? Sure he would. Then the Lord looks at him and says, what have you done? Buster. First time Buster was ever used. If you don't, Buster, evil is at the door. And its desire is you. That evil he's referring to is a Hebraic word for death. It will consume you. Evil is at the door, and it's like a lion ready to consume power. Not just hurt you a little bit, smack your rat a little bit. We'll destroy you. That's all the way back to Cain and Abel. First kids in the Bible. First you. Of course, Cain doesn't get better. He goes and kills his brother. Didn't go well after that. Hasn't gone well yet. 
Nahum has a horrible job. He has to go back to a people once considered God's own children and tell them they're not God's own children anymore. Tell them that they are the enemy. Not the enemy they're looking at, the Assyrians. They are the enemy. In fact, the Assyrians don't even matter. They are the Assyri- they, they are the enemy of God. You are now no longer God's children. When God speaks, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. It dries up the rivers, blossoms wither, mountains quake, hills dissolve. The earth is upheaved by his very presence, the world, the presence of the world and all its inhabitants. Who can stand before this kind of anger? This kind of indignation? Who? Ralph has poured out stronghold. He is, used to be the stronghold in the day of trouble. But now he knows those who have taken refuge in him and those who have not. He will make a complete end of the sight of those who have become an enemy to him. Not just slap them around. He's had enough. Whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up with the Lord twice. When he, when he acts, it is a guaranteed 100% kill. You will be destroyed. There will be no escapes. Who plots against the Lord? The wicked counselors who plot against the Lord and teach you to do the same. Even though they are at full strength, they will be cut off and pass away. Now some people think God's not just talking about His people. They also think He's talking about the Assyrians who once pledged their lives to God and repented before Lord, but now the new king and Sennacherib, the new commander of the armies, will come around and destroy Israel completely and take that as a sign that there is no God. Or not, no God that they have to worry about concerning Israel. What they fail to understand is they're not destroying Israel. God is destroying Israel because they have turned away from Him. So, history tells us that after the destruction of the Northern Kingdom, they came down and besieged Jerusalem. 187,000 of them. And if you read on in the Chronicles and the Kings, you'll, hear, you'll see this. And Sennacherib came down here, deciding to put an end to Israel once and for all, forever. But see, God wasn't mad with these people. In fact, quite the opposite. They were doing great. They had good kings like Uzziah and Joash. They were magnificent kings. And they got everybody in church, and everybody knew the Lord. And, God was prospering this, this region mightily. So they besieged the city, and of course Uzziah went into the temple and said, well, I don't know what to do. We don't have this kind of army. And that's what God told him. You go up on the walls and have fun. Take the weekend off, boys. This is my fight. And he didn't understand it. I mean, he admits that. Lord, that doesn't make any sense at all, but... You know, you're God and I'm not, so I'm going to go up on the wall. I got, I got a party up there I'd like to go to. The Lord took care of the Assyrians once and for all, just as Nahum said. Listen to that phrase again. Whatever you devise against the Lord, whatever your wisdom is, He will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up and come against him twice. Once you got, you know, once you become an enemy of God, you are an enemy of God. And he will deal with that. Like tangled thorns, those who are drunk with their drink and they are consumed immediately and the stubble is completely withered. One who plotted against the Lord, those wicked counselors, thus says the Lord, even though they are at full strength, this is one of the, the Assyrian army, at full strength, and they are many, even so they shall be cut off and passed away from me. And I will afflict them no longer. So now I will break the yoke bar from upon you 
and I will tear off your shackles as you fell. And the Lord issued command concerning you that your name shall no longer be perpetuated. This is back to his people. You're done. The northern kingdoms are going to be destroyed, and the enemy that destroyed them will also be destroyed. It was the greatest battles in the history of the Middle Eastern uh, territory. And it was not by the hand of man, it was by the will of God. I've had enough. Some will even liken this to, and Shirley mentioned that this morning to me, uh, the fight between good and evil, God and Satan. And you can liken it that far, because obviously God's so-called children have become the enemy. Well, who is the enemy? It is the devil. In fact, when you get to the revelation of John, this is the fight. All the way up until the last battle, chapter 20, where the sons of light and the sons of darkness clash for the final time. And they are destroyed and they are thrown into the lake of fire and burned without end. And then the enemy, I mean, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Death is thrown into the lake of fire. Everything is thrown into the lake of fire except those whom God knew were his and his children come home. So this is the fight that Jesus mentioned and Paul mentions many times in the New Testament. Remember, Paul was the priest of the priest of the priest. He knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. The New Testament wasn't written yet. In fact, Paul didn't even know he was writing it. But during the course of his writings, he says, I now understand our fight is not with flesh and blood. It's not Chris against Chan. Uh, even though he might be Assyrian and I might be Israeli, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is against the dark principalities and the light principalities, meaning the righteous and the unrighteous, or God and Satan. That's the war. Now, Nahum, your job is to tell people they're, they're, they're turning too much towards the dark and not to the light. Who wants that job? Jesus said, Janice, you know, you believe in me, and that's really great. But I'm going to die because they hate me. And very possible you could die because people hate you as well. They hated me, they'll hate you. They beat me, they'll beat you. It's not an if, it's a when. And when that happens, when the world comes against you, remember, it came against me. But this time, remember, I'm right here with you. Right here with you. Still physical, still real, still in control. Still God. And yet, should you die, so shall you live. And if you live and I return, you'll never die. But the promise stands, regardless of the circumstances. Well, Paul figured that out to where he could say, for me to live is Christ. If I, die, if I have to die, that's game. In the sense, you can only kill me once. <laughs> you can chop me up and you know, keep killing me over and over again. But that means nothing to me. It is given a man, every man and woman, to die but one time. And once that's over, you're either in the Father's rest or you're not. <coughs> Our fight is not with flesh and blood any longer. Paul figured this out. It's with principalities of darkness and principalities of life. But in Romans 8, he says, but I am convinced nothing, not the principalities of darkness, not the kingdoms, not, not this or that or that, or kings or kingdoms or armies, not love, not hate, nothing, nothing can separate us from God. Nothing can separate us from God. At the Last Supper, Jesus looked at his voice and said, Salvation is from the Lord. Period. And if you have it, of whom should you be afraid? I am with you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. Of whom should you be afraid? Of what should you be afraid? 
even if you die, yet shall you live, and if you live and I return, you shall never die. Death was no big deal to Jesus. He said, it was a twinkling of an eye. Beep, beep, that quick, boom. Pain, death, disease, sadness, light, joy, peace. No mourning, no death, no crying, none of those bad things. They don't exist here. They exist down there. But they don't exist here. Write these words, John, for they are faithful and they are true, and take them to my children in the churches. Take them to my babies, who should be worshiping about now, and teach them. I am the God of yesterday, today, and forever. Well, this is Nahum's problem. And he started out saying, do you realize, Katie, if you didn't know this, that the Lord thinks you're the finest Christian in all of Florida? Probably didn't realize that, did you? But if I was from God and told you that, what would you think? Well, you believe God. Well, if you believe it. You gotta go. You gotta go? Okay. <laughs> Well, I will, but I'm trying to make an invisible God very visible. And that promise stands regardless of whether we're aware of it or not. And, you know, how many people have been speeding down the highway at 100 miles an hour and they get pulled over and the cop says, do you know how fast you were going? <laughs> and you pull a bonehead move and say, well, I didn't know what the speed limit was. You know, that never gets you off the hook. 